Hi, I'm Jason Gayheimer, PFR Manager, Bex Hybrids. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about planter setup. So a couple of topics we're going to hit on downforce, row cleaners, disc openers, and high-speed systems. So we've got some new PFR proven information, uh, and we're going to share that with some agronomic topics around those as well. So we're going to start off with downforce. Uh, when I talk about downforce, I get a lot of questions on what type. <clears throat> Do I want to go manual? Do I need fully automated systems? What other considerations are there, benefits uh, to these systems? So um, th there's different kinds, right? You got spring, you have pneumatic, we've got hydraulic. And, and my recommendation is always hydraulic, whether you're doing high speed or you're doing normal five mile an hour planting operations. And um, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the pros and cons in that, but even if you're at springs or you're at pneumatic, I wanna be at, I wanna be at hydraulic, okay? And I want to be fully automated. Uh, I do not want to have to be in a manual type setting with hydraulic downforce. So we'll start showing a little data here, and this is three-year multi-location PFR proven data for uh, Delta Force, which is a precision planning hydraulic downforce. And so we're fully automated with our control with Delta Force, and we're comparing that to 50, 125, and 250 pounds of static manual pressure. <clears throat> and the one thing I like to point out with this research before we even get started is that when we designed this study, we were trying to simulate uh, spring pressures of 50, 125, and 250. But in doing this with how our planters are set up, we are using hydraulic, the same hydraulic cylinder, to hit manual 50, 125, and 250. And so if you think about that right out of the gate, we're already a little bit better than what it would be if it was springs uh, utilized in this, in this study. So think about that when we're looking at this data. Also consider the fact that we're doing this in nice uniform uh, plots versus field scale uh, with more variability within that field. So if you look at this data, you can see there's, there's tremendous gains to be had for being fully automated. Because if you're in a standard setting, even with hydraulic, you can lose some serious bushels by being stuck in one setting if it's the wrong setting for that particular part of the field. And that's gonna change throughout the field. So you look at our stand counts that we have taken uh, through these evaluations throughout the years, and there's, there is a difference in stand, right? We have a gain in stand for fully automated, but it's not, it's not extremely significant. There is some stand differences, but it's not extremely large. So why are we seeing those yield differences? Better seed to soil contact, better depth control, Having the right amount of down pressure is important for many different reasons. It's, it's also important when you start thinking about the money you spent in your meter and singulating, because it can singulate perfect, but when it lets go of that seed and you have a standard seed tube, it still has to fall to that ground and it, we don't want it to lose that spacing. So if there is chatter in your row unit or if it's a rougher ride and that row unit isn't stabilized, you could have spent a lot of money in that metering system and then you potentially lose back some of that money if you haven't stabilized that row unit with a system like hydraulic. So very important there, even though all those seeds may get down to the ground, they may get up, they may lose that spacing if you've got a rough ride where hydraulic can help eliminate that rough ride on that row unit. So I'm gonna start with some uh, data here at 2021 Central Illinois downforce. And what I wanna talk about here is uh, we're in central Illinois, pretty good soil, uh, pretty uniform where we, where we test this, right? But uh, the worst setting we had manually was two bushel. So if we picked that wrong setting and we didn't have fully automated, we could have lost two bushel. Let's move east to Indiana, okay? Uh, the previous data set was conventional tillage. Uh, this is conventional tillage as well here in Indiana. So now we're getting into a little more clay, Okay, and so now you see if we pick the wrong setting, static setting in Indiana at the, at the conditions we had, now we're at six, almost seven bushel loss. Let's keep going east. Let's look at Ohio downforce. What if we pick the wrong setting in Ohio? This is no-till, much heavier clay conditions. Now this is starting to get dramatic. Now we're even, we're even, we're losing a lot of ground contact and we're losing a lot of stand. Okay, so that's that 50 pound manual setting. If we pick that one as our standard setting across that field, uh, we're in a little bit of trouble there, right? Nobody wants to lose 36 bushel. So let's take a look and see what that looked like. This is a picture showing it, okay? And fully automated, <clears throat> you can see the stand, picture perfect stands, a good, nice uniform emergence where 50, there's huge gaps, there's sporadic emergence, not as good root development and early, early plant vigor. So you can see right there by that picture why we, we had that opportunity to lose 36 bushel. 
Okay, let's look back at this again. Okay, this is that same Ohio data, 125, right? So we, we didn't lose as much as we did with, the 30, with losing 36 bushel with the 50 pound, but we're still you know, close to losing 10 bushel by being in that wrong, that wrong pressure setting. And here's, here's what that looked like, right? That 125 does look a little better than that 50 did, but once again, it still does not look as good as the control fully automated. And like I said before, this is in nice uniform plots, okay? So when you take this stuff field scale, there's way more variability, different soil types, different tillage, rough, potential for rougher conditions out field scale. And so typically you can take what the, the gains that we've seen from fully automated and add to that uh, quite a bit when you're taking it field scale versus how we're testing it in these nice uniform plots. Okay, now this is 2020 data. So this is some of the this is some of the worst results we've had in terms of if you're in a if you're in a static setting and it's the wrong setting. Okay, so in 2020 in Ohio, no-till, heavy clay, once again, you can see we actually had to replant two of the treatments. 50 and 125 was just not enough to keep ground contact. It wasn't enough to get uh, plants out of the ground. So we actually had to replant those treatments. This doesn't happen very often in PFR. It's got to be pretty bad for us to just tear it up and start over. And so you can see here, we had to do that with those two treatments in 2020. It just took more downforce. Okay. <clears throat> and so when we start thinking about how, how these systems pay off, we like to show equipment in what I call acres to pay off graphs format. And so this is for the corn research. Uh, and what this graph shows, green bar is $4.50 corn, gray is $5.50, and light green is $6.50. And then we've got different uh, number of, of row unit planters, 12, 16, and 24. So this is the number of acres it's going to take to pay off that in investment based off what delta force costs per row at the different corn pricings, and then looking at the yield gain potential that we have with fully automated hydraulic downforce. And so let's just take middle of the road example, 16 row planter, 550 corn. We, we can, we can uh, get that paid off in just under 1,200 uh, acres. And so for me, it's a no-brainer. Like I said before, it's one of the first things I'm going to talk to you about if you're looking to spend some money on your planter and you don't currently have hydraulic downforce. Once again, bean data. <clears throat> um, you know, we're not seeing 10 bushel in this, in this example here, right? Uh, a couple things with, with soybeans and how we do that research. Uh, some of this is no-till and some is conventional tillage. It's a mixture of both. But you think about the times where you're out in a field and, and a lot, I think a lot of us you know, may have no-till soybeans and we may even plant at a slight angle. I think it's going to be very, very important to have hydraulic downforce and fully automated hydraulic system uh, when you're doing things like that because there is such a great chance of, of not having good ground contact throughout as you're going planting across no-till stalks or really any time. But you look at our data, nice uniform plots. Once again, we're picking up one to two bushel by having a fully automated system. Stand, once again, yes, we had an improved stand, but it's not super significant. Once again, it just comes back to having good ground contact, the right amount, keeping the, the proper depth for good, uniform, even emergence. Acres to pay off, once again, we're, you know, middle of the road here again, $12 beans, 16 row planter, you know, we're looking at uh, just under 1,500 acres to pay off that investment on a bean planter. Now, if you're a split row planter, obviously you have a 12 row splitter, you, you know, you're going to want to double those, those number of acres to pay off that investment. But still, uh, one of those things that, that I just really think is a no brainer if you're going to spend money on that planter and you don't currently have hydraulic downforce. So we're going to switch gears, talk about row cleaners. It's another hot topic. Uh, we've been asked a lot of questions on row cleaners over the last year or two. Uh, and those questions tend to be which type? Um, what are things I need to consider? What are the benefits? So there's different style of row cleaners. And then there's fixed row cleaner versus, uh, you know, pneumatic adjustment and having cab control, uh, control from the cab. <clears throat> and so you got to think about all those things and what, what are your needs and what would work for you. There's some new row cleaners out there, right? Not just new styles of the blades, but uh, one of the pictures there you see is Precision Planning's uh, Reveal row cleaner. So it's a bar mounted uh, row cleaner, which I, you know, one of the benefits I can instantly think of from a system like that is if you're planting into a bunch of rocks. If you have tend to have a lot of rocks in your fields, uh, I would rather have my rocks hit my row cleaner if it's attached to my my bar versus my row cleaner being attached to my row unit. So that's one instant benefit I think there can be from a, a system like Reveal. So let's look at our data. Our data is from uh, Yetter row cleaners, and uh, this is this is no till. Uh, yield results here from multi-location three year. 
And you can see right around four bushel gains. And so what we did is we have our control of no row cleaners. We have floating row cleaners, and then we have a, a, a setting and a treatment where we put about 25 pound constant down pressure on that row cleaner to make sure it, it stays grounded well and can remove all that residue. You look at stands, right? And so we had four bushel, and there's not a significant difference in stand, a little difference, but so you're probably sitting there going, okay, well, if it didn't change our stands, what made that bushel difference, okay? And so I want to show one of the reasons why, you know, uh, it, it has to do with uh, insect pressure. It also has to do with warming up that soil and having much more uh, uniform, even emergence, quicker emergence by moving that residue away. Hopefully that, that soil is getting a little more sunshine on it and it's able to warm up and have more consistent temperatures to get out of the ground uniform uh, and quicker. But what we've seen is insect pressure. So this is a picture of the, what the no row cleaner treatment looked like. And you can see, um, it's kind of hard to even tell where the rows are, but then you look at the picture of the corn plant, you see the residue around the plant, you see the feeding, got some slug feeding on this one in particular. This, this picture is from Indiana. And here we go to our floating row cleaner. So now you can see we're clearing more of that residue away. However, there still is a little bit of residue around that plant, but we've, we've minimized the insect feeding on that plant by, able, by being able to put row cleaners on and move some of that residue away. So let's move up to 25 pounds down, okay? Now you can see there is no residue around that corn plant and those insects tend to not bother those plants as much because they don't wanna come back to that plant and be exposed to the sun and heat, have nothing to hide under, okay? So they tend to stay away from the plants more when there isn't residue for them to immediately go and hide under. And, but you can see uh, from the picture of the infield scenario there that we have moved a significant amount of dirt. So there's gonna be a balancing act from getting the row clean but you also don't want to throw too much dirt to where you're creating a trench that you're planting in. Okay, so you got to kind of uh, watch the situation. That's where I think it's very, very nice to have control from the cab as you go out through, go through different parts of the field and you can have that adjustment on the fly if you need to tweak it just a little bit because you're throwing too much dirt or maybe you do need to put more, more uh, weight down on it to make sure and keep it clean right there in, in that furrow. So once again, we want to reference acres to pay off when we show our, our three-year yield data. Uh, and you can see here, um, 700 acres or less really to pay off even a 24-row planter when you're talking about our corn data. So once again, it's, it's one of those investments that uh, sometimes you can have some sticker shock with. Every, you know, all these, all these planter attachments come with a price tag. And I don't want you making a decision based on that price tag alone. That's not the, that's not the right way to do it. You need to look at these acres to pay off. Uh, how many acres are you running your planter across every year? Does this investment make sense for you based off of how we have it uh, represented on this slide? Let's talk about soybeans, bushel, uh, half a bushel. So once again, you go to so the soybean world and, and you know we're not seeing four or five bushel, but once again, I'm gonna explain to you how this research is conducted in PFR and, and how this data set is represented. So when we do row cleaner research in PFR, it is no-till, okay? But what we're doing is we're using RTK and we're, we're splitting those stalks, those stalk rows, right? So this is once again where I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about if you're planting at an angle or you don't have RTK and you're kinda weaving across some no-till stalks or you're truly planting at an angle across them, um, you're gonna see a much, much bigger advantage to row cleaners if you're doing any of those uh, scenarios I just described versus how we're doing it. But even gaining a bushel for us, uh, is significant. We're seeing a nice increase in stand with these soybeans, especially this year. We had a lot of we had a lot of insect pressure and um, and different challenges with residue this spring, cooler temperatures. So it was nice to get that residue out of the way this spring. Once again, acres to pay off on soybeans. Uh, you can see. Let's look at the middle of the road here. 16 row planter, 12 bushel or 12 bushel, uh, 12 dollar per bushel soybeans. Uh, 800 acres to pay off that investment. Once again, keep in mind, if you have a split row planter, you're gonna wanna double those numbers uh, of acres to pay off for that investment. Let's talk about disc openers. Uh, we had a lot of questions on these. These are the STP disc openers. So looking at standard OEM disc openers versus what these STP disc openers uh, have to offer. What are the benefits? So this is a nice representation of kind of, of, of what it looks like. So we've got our control standard a disc opener. Uh, I don't want you to focus on uh, some of the residue and soil that, have, that fell back in that, in that image, but look at the sidewall in particular of the standard disc opener versus the STP disc opener sidewall. And you can see 
some nice stress cracks and fractures in the sidewall with the STP disc openers. That's where we're seeing a, a, a pretty big advantage. Okay, and the number two thing is look at the bottom of the trench on the STP disc opener. It's, it's more flat. It, it creates more of a U shape versus the true V shape of the standard opener. So there's less chance when you drop that seed for there to be an air pocket underneath or around that seed when the bottom of your trench is shaped more like a U or a little flatter than what a standard opener can do. But really like to point out, you know, those sidewall fracture, a standard disc opener is going to basically just kind of spread open, smear, if you will, that sidewall and compact it. Okay, that's just how it operates. Okay, so then you're relying on your closing wheels and things like that to, to take that sidewall compaction back out, which is fine. We can do that with a lot of aftermarket closing wheels, but what if we just don't have to create that sidewall compaction to begin with? The STP disc openers are a little different in the fact that they're serrated. They're also different sizes from left to right, okay, on that planter. And so what that's gonna do is they're gonna spin at slightly different speeds as you're going through the field. And that's gonna create a cutting action and then as that disc opener comes around and it's serrated, it's, that's where it's gonna fracture that sidewall. It's gonna kind of lift it just a little, but it's still gonna keep its shape, its form, but it's gonna fracture that sidewall so that your, your early root development can go both ways and it has an easy path to create a nice, uniform, robust root system right early on. So let's look at some yield data. We've got a bushel or two that we consistently see out of out of these STP disc openers. And so guys are saying, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I think I can get a bushel or two. Is it worth it? Okay, and so we get that question a lot. You look at stand, because that's the next question. Well, did it improve my stand? Overall, statistically, no, it didn't really improve our stand, okay? But what it can do is it can improve the uniform of emergence by hopefully helping to eliminate potential chances for having air pockets. And once again, like I said, we've got a little better uh, root development, uh, especially as you look at uh, on how the roots are developing on both sides of those, those young plants, it's just a little more consistent, a little bit more robust around the STP uh, disc opener in terms of uniform of emergence, root development, plant vigor. And so that's where we're able to pick up another bushel or two from the standard disc openers. So let's look at those acres to pay off, okay? So once again, we're gonna use that 450, 550, 650 uh, dollar on corn, 12, 16, 24 row planter, okay? And so there's not a lot of acres here to pay off this investment. However, with the STP disc openers, you do wanna ensure that they stay sharp, okay? And so a lot, there's, uh, I've talked to a lot of different growers that have tried them. Uh, a lot of growers like them. Some guys say, well, I gotta change them more often than my standard openers. I just don't know, okay? So that's where, this is where something where I'm gonna recommend you if you're interested to try a few rows, see the longevity that you can get out of them because it, it's gonna be different depending on soil type, um, tillage condition, all those things are gonna dictate how long you can run a set before you have to change them. But what I do like about the STPs is the fact that the bearing and the hub assembly are much more robust uh, and do have a better longevity than standard openers. And so um, there's a, with these STP openers, you can actually change out the disc blades themselves um, without having to change everything. So a lot of guys are telling us that they can get two or three changes on the discs themselves before they actually have to go and replace the, the bearing in the hub and, and, and pay for the whole, the whole system again. Soybean data, very consistent to what we see in corn. We see a bushel to two bushels on soybeans as well uh, throughout our three-year multi-location data set. And I like to also mention that the corn data set I just showed as well as the soybean data set, it is a combination of no-till and conventional tillage research. Uh, we originally were, were planning on breaking it out, uh, but in the end, Unlike what I originally thought it would be, uh, the data is very similar, very, very similar when you look at conventional tillage versus no-till. I really thought there'd be a bigger advantage in a no-till environment, but there wasn't. Uh, we see very consistent performance regardless of tillage practice, regardless of condition even. So looking at stand, once again, I'm showing you not a lot of stand increase there, right? But once again, it is uh, the fact that we're eliminating that sidewall compaction a little bit better with these openers and we're getting better root development and quicker, more even emergence um, from these disc openers. And it's making the difference, right? So you can see, once again, pretty low acres to pay off these investments. My, my recommendation, like I said earlier, is go ahead and try a couple rows on these, run them for a year and see what you like. Um, because there are, there's pros, there's cons, and uh, maybe they're not for everybody. We like them, I think, I think they're definitely worth trying. So put a couple rows on, see what you think, and go from there. Last topic I'm gonna hit on is high speed systems. 
So we've been testing high speed for the last three years. Um, we've been using precision planning speed tube. We've got three year data set on it now, which I'm gonna share with you here in just a little bit. But what's really unique about what we did in 2021 is we had the opportunity to test all three of the high speed technologies that are on the market today. I don't know any other company that has been able to do some unbiased research on all three. So I really think we're the only ones out there that can give you uh, some data on all three and an, and an unbiased look at all three as well. So just a little bit about each one. So this is the precision planning speed tube. Like I mentioned before, we've got the most data, the most experience with this high speed delivery system. And so it is a, it is a more pocketed belt type delivery system from that meter. Uh, we like that, you know, you pair, you pair this with the precision planning components, the uh, precision B-set meter, the 2020 monitor field view. There's a lot of great things that we've used and uh, from precision planning that work really well. And, th and this is added, we're adding this to that list also. So you can see estimated pricing um, um, for these systems uh, at the bottom here. John Deere Exact Emerge, it's the first year we've been able to evaluate the John Deere Exact Emerge system. It's more of a, a brush style uh, delivery system versus the pocketed belt. Okay, so that's, that's the major difference. Um, but we're not really trying to compare them against each other. That's not what we're doing. What we wanna do is we wanna test all these systems and just make sure they are working as each company says they do. We wanna prove that out, that when you're, when you're getting, being, talking to John Deere and they're telling you this is what Exact Emerge is gonna do, we wanna make sure and give you an unbiased opinion that, that you know, that's, what, that's true, this is what you can expect and um, you know, how quick can I pay that off? Is it worth the investment for me? And so that's really what we're trying to do when we look at all these different systems because there's, pro, there's pros and cons to all of them. They're all a little different, price tag's different. Um, what what uh, row units you can assemble these on is different. And so you really gotta be thinking about all those different things when you're trying to get into high speed. The new kid on the block is the Ag Leader Sure Speed. It's, uh, it, it's one that we had the, a chance to look at this year as well. And so I'm gonna call it a little bit of a hybrid between the other two. It is a more of a pocketed belt delivery system down, but there is uh, uh, some brush assembly up taking the seat off the meter. And so it's a little different. Like I said, I call it a, a hybrid between the other two. Okay, and so a little more about that um, here on the screen, the in-command 1200 monitor that can be paired with it, Agfinity system, uh, and then a, there's your price tag at the bottom as well. So I'm gonna go back to uh, hydraulic downforce just a little bit because you, you really can't talk high speed without talking about downforce. Okay, and this is field scale research now that we're looking at here where we utilize the Ag Leader Sureforce. That's their hydraulic downforce system. This is on the planner that had the, the Ag Leader high speed system on it. Okay, and what I like to point out is the red area there uh, in the center of the field leading up to, you know, it looks like a power pole, which it was. It was a power pole that we had to plant around there. And so what happened there, why you see it, it's in red, right? Meaning we, it took a lot more down pressure to be in that optimum range in that area than the rest of the field. Now, yeah, the whole, the whole field is multicolored on how much pressure, it, uh, applied pressure down it took to keep us in the sweet spot, which is proof once again why it's so important to have a fully automated system. But then the red area, it's like, okay, well, what's going on there? Well, the story behind that is, is the power company had to come out and work on that pole. And uh, convenient enough, right, they, they had to come out and do it when it was not, the ground was not fit to be on. So they had to drive some heavy equipment out across that field and it was wet and they created a lot of compaction. And so when we planted, our, our planter load cells found that, right? And, they, and, it, and it recognized we need a lot more downforce right here in this area to keep ground contact, to get it at the right planting depth. And so you see that represented there. Okay, and, and this is a spring conventional till field. So the red circle there is showing you that on average, our applied downforce across that field was about 43 on average, right? It varied a lot. Sometimes we even needed lift. Now we go to a fall strip till. So now we're just, we're just changing tillage practice here, right? And so now look at our average applied downforce needed to stay in that sweet spot, 113. So it took a little more. So now, you know, even just talking different tillage practices, you, you, you just can't take one system, set a, set a down pressure setting and be right all the time. It's, it's impossible and you're gonna lose yield somewhere. Okay, and how much? That is just gonna depend, but this is just showing the examples of as you're going through different conditions, as you're going different speeds, that is truly going to vary on how much you need. So here's a great, a great graph showing the gray bars being the gauge wheel downforce. Uh, and you can see we're targeting about 90 pounds is what we're wanting to have on the gauge wheels themselves at all times. 
And so you can see as we speed up from five mile an hour to seven and a half and 10, the green bars are gonna are representing how much actual applied downforce it took on those row units to keep the gauge wheels in that sweet spot of down pressure, right? And so you can see as we went faster, took more pressure, right? I don't think, I don't think that's anything shocking there, but it's just a great example of um, what it's gonna take as you vary speed throughout the field. Because with these high speed systems, you're not just gonna put it on your planter and plant 10 mile an hour all the time. There's gonna be areas of your field where you probably still plant five mile an hour, right? So you're gonna, what it is gonna do, it's gonna give you the opportunity to plant faster, hopefully get the same result in the end, but you are gonna be able to vary that speed more than you probably do today based on the conditions and where you're planting. And so because of that, that's another reason why hydraulic automated systems become even more important. So one last example here on uh, some pretty unique information that we were able to pull field scale. So this is, this is um, I'm gonna show you this map and I'm gonna show you one more right after it. And the only difference is how the field was, was cultivated. Okay, so they're both conventional tillage fields. This particular field was cultivated the same angle as in which we planted. And you can see on average, it took about 59 pounds of applied downforce to keep in that sweet spot. Now let's go to a field right nearby Okay, the only difference is we cultivated at a slight angle from the angle we were planting. Now it's 88 pounds on average. So it took more applied down force on average and the only thing we changed was just the angle in which we cultivated slightly. Okay, and you can see that that little change changed how much hydraulic down force on average that we needed. And so just another great example of it just doesn't take much to change that, that aspect of, of why down force is so critical. Let's, look, let's get into the meat and potatoes of, of these three high-speed systems now, okay? So let's look at final stands. And the one of the things I wanna point out is, and I mentioned it before, is we are not taking these systems and putting them in the same field and comparing them head-to-head -head right at each other, okay? We're trying to prove each one out for what, what it is and what they say it can do, okay? So let's look at SpeedTube. That, that data set um, was planted at 34,000, okay? Uh, exact Emerge was planted at, at, a, at a trial here in Indiana and the planting population was 35,000. Sure Speed was planted over in uh, uh, West Central Illinois at 34,000. So we don't have the same planting populations as these because of where we conducted the research. But what I wanna show you and point out with this slide is that we're not losing final stands as we go faster. Statistically, we're not losing anything. Actually, on a couple of them, we're, we're gaining decent stand when we go faster. So um, that's one of the things we really wanted to be able to prove or disprove is, you know, are we gonna lose stand as we go faster, okay? But that's just one piece of the puzzle. So no, we're not losing stand as we're going all the way up to 10 mile an hour with any of these systems. But what about singulation? That's what is probably more important uh, along the lines of high speeding, uh, high speed planting. So let's look at all three systems again. Let's look at five, seven and a half, 10 mile an hour. This is not singulation out of the monitor. What these singulation numbers are is this is singulation out of the ground, plants out of the ground singulation. So this required days of counting plants. And you know, how we did that is if we came across a double, a skip, you know, we're gonna document those things and we're gonna tally up our out of the ground singulation. Now, one of the things that has to be done for this to be true data to represent the system is that if we came across a skip, we needed to dig. And if we found a seed that we could not credit, we could not uh, take that away from the planter. So we credited the planter for doing its job. So once in a while we would find where there was a skip, but the seed was there. Uh, that's not the planter's fault. That's not the high speed delivery system's fault. So uh, those are factored into this. And so you can see out of the ground singulation of 97% or higher, that's amazing. And so when these companies come to you and they talk about their systems and they say, look, you're gonna be able to plant up to 10 mile an hour or 12 or whatever, and you're not statistically gonna lose singulation, stand, it's true, it's accurate. These systems work as advertised, all three of them. So we're gonna work through a, an example now, and I'm gonna, we're gonna, the rest of this data is gonna be focused on SpeedTube uh, for the reason that it's the one we have the most data on. So we have three year multi-location data on SpeedTube, it's technically PFR proven, uh, just at five mile an hour. So we were able to gain uh, you know, almost a bushel by just adding that system on there and not going any faster, right? Because instead of letting that seed free fall, it's delivering it all the way to the ground at the same speed in which you're moving forward so it does not have opportunity to roll and, and mess up spacing by using that delivery system. So that's why you, you, you'll see a lot of data from us and from other companies that 
when you just add a high speed delivery system and you go the same speed as a standard seed tube, you can actually pick up yield and that's why. Okay, but now the, the meat and potatoes of it is can we go faster and, and you know, we showed that we're not really losing any singulation or stan, so what's the result when it comes to yield because that's what matters. Statistically, we're not losing yield. When we went up to seven and a half mile an hour, we lost absolutely nothing compared to five with a standard seed tube. We get to 10, we had a slight uh, loss in yield, but not even a bushel, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna work through an example and we're gonna factor in uh, that 10 mile an hour um, and seven and a half mile, uh, seven and a half mile an hour into this, this example that we're gonna work through, okay? So what I wanna show is I wanna show a, a 16 row planter at five mile an hour and on average you can plant about 17 acres an hour. Okay, let's take that same 16 row, let's retrofit it, put speed tube on there and let's run it at seven and a half mile an hour, okay? We're gonna kick it up just two and a half mile an hour on average, okay? Now we can plant 25 acres per hour, 47% increase. I, I'm pretty sure everyone would raise their hand if I, if I asked the question of, do you wanna plant 47% more acres per hour as long as you get the same result, right? I, that's a no brainer. Okay, so let's work through an example of a grower has 4,000 acres. Got 2,000 acres of corn, 2,000 acres of soybean. This particular grower plants all the corn first. Done with that, we switch over to beans and we plant beans. That's not our recommendation on how to do it, but that's how we're gonna work through this example uh, for today. And so the, the grower with the 16 row planter at five mile an hour, roughly it takes 19.6 days to plant those 4,000 acres. And when I'm, when I'm working through this example, and when I say 19.6 days, that's not 24 hour days. We used an average of 12 hours per day planting time in the field. Uh, is that's what this is represented on. So now you look at the 16 row with the high speed at seven and a half mile an hour and it takes 13.3 days. So we're, we're dropping off roughly six days of planting time here. So let's pencil that out uh, uh, using some of our yield data, some of our planting date data and some weather data. So this was looking at multi-state uh, USDA days suitable for field work. So we're gonna look at April, May and June here. The green bars are 2019, the gray bars are the last four year average on days suitable for field work. The dotted line across the center, that's roughly half the days in a week here, right? So you can see all the green bars, a lot less time in the field. And I think a lot of us, that's, you know, that, that's what 2019 was about. Uh, we had a lot of rain, we had a lot less days suitable for being in there doing field work. So we're gonna use 2019 as an example, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out three different planting windows in particular that, that you know, it really represented well for here in, in Indiana for our situation in 2019. So we had a, a, a small window there in mid to late April to plant, then we got rained out for a couple weeks, had another small window mid to late May, got rained out for a little bit again, finished up, our, you know, m the bulk of our pl planting, honestly, in June. Okay, so in order to work the example I'm getting ready to show you, we need to factor in planting date data. Okay, and so we have one of the most robust data sets on planting date. This is a 21 year multi-location planting date graph for corn. And you can see our optimum window over that time on average has been uh, mid to late April. From that point on, we start losing yield potential, okay? Let's just say we're gonna, we're gonna use this uh, to work through this example. Any of the corn that we planted mid to late April, we're at 200 bushel. Now, anything planted in that second window that, of opportunity that I said we had, we're gonna lose 7.7%. We're gonna be at that 185 range on potential now. And then we get into June, all the corn we had left to plant in June, unfortunately, its potential on average was around that 158. We're gonna do the same thing with soybeans because we got 2,000 acres of corn, 2,000 acres of soybeans in this example. So once again, our, our optimum planting date is the same time uh, that we're planting corn, right? Which is why I mentioned our recommendation isn't to plant corn then beans. If you can plant them both at the same time, start early, um, you're gonna have a bigger bang for your buck. There's just much more potential there for higher yields and a better ROI. And so once again, as time goes on, we start losing the percentage of optimum yield. We're going we're gonna to do the bean example using a base point of 65 bushel uh, for any of the beans planted there mid to late April. Start losing based off our 24 year multi location data set on soybeans. Um, we're going to go down to 60 of anything planted late May and around 55 bushel on anything planted there in June. Okay, so let's start working through this example. At first planting date, we had, we had about five days. Okay, so the, the grower with the five mile an hour planter, he was able to plant about just right around 1,000 acres of corn in that first window. Okay, got rained out, came back, finished corn, switched to soybeans. 
was able to plant about 244 acres of soybeans in that second planting window, then had to finish the bulk majority of the soybean planting in that third window. Okay, and you can see some of the figures there on how that penciled out. Now let's look at the seven and a half mile an hour. Okay, we got 1,500 acres planted in that first window, so roughly 500 more acres planted in that first window. And remember, with corn, we were talking 200 bushel, and then we lost from there, right? So we had 500 acres uh, more in that, in that high speed environment planted in a higher potential for yield window. Okay, and then we get in that second window, finish corn, but this grower switched the beans, got, now we've got the bulk majority of our beans planted in May instead of June, okay? And you can see how that penciled out. So now, once we put all that together, we look at our grand total, okay, for this, for this example that we've been working through. And if you were corn only, so if you bought high speed for that corn planter and you were only planting, planting 2,000 acres of corn and say you have a different planter for beans, you know, we had an advantage of over 34,000 for just putting it on our corn planter in this example. Now, if that, plant, if that planter was utilized for corn and soybeans that year, $97,000, okay? And like I said, I'm not going out here and telling you, hey, if you do this every, and you plant uh, 2,000 acres of corn, 2,000 acres of beans, you can expect 97,000 return uh, every year. That's just an example. But the, the thing about this is it's all data, unbiased data that we have to be able to work through an example like this to show you the potential that can be there, and it's big, okay? So time is money. Just like that opening slide that we talked about, it is time is money when it comes to some of these planning technologies. So putting high speed all together, it's not as simple as just going and getting, picking one of these three high speed systems, throwing it on your planter, gearing it up to 10 mile an hour and putting it in the wind, right? We have to have a lot of things that all come together. They have to come together quickly. Um, and efficiently, just like a puzzle, okay? So every piece has its place and it has to be there. You can't be missing one of these pieces of the puzzle to be successful with high speed planning. You need RTK guidance. You need more horsepower to, go, to be able to pull that planter faster. You gotta have the delivery system. Um, think about high capacity fertilizer systems because if you're applying fertilizer now and you're thinking about going high speed and one of the things you're thinking if you do that is I'm just gonna quit putting fertilizer on the planter, I'd recommend you not doing that because we have proven there's benefit to putting starter down with that planter. So let's figure out how we can still do that even at higher speeds. Durable row unit, you must have a durable row unit. You know, obviously going faster is harder on the planter, it's harder on the row units, and so we gotta make sure we have good durable row units. So that may mean not just putting the high speed on your current row unit, you may need to upgrade to a, a newer, more durable, maybe a cast row unit to handle, uh, you know, the little more of a beating that this planter is gonna take. Gotta have hydraulic downforce. I think you gotta have it on any planter, whether you're going two mile an hour or 12 mile an hour, um, but absolute must for, for high speed planning. Proper maintenance on everything. Hydraulic capacity, you really gotta be thinking about the hydraulic flow and what that tractor can handle. Adjustable row cleaners on the fly, a strong toolbar, good field conditions, and I love aftermarket closing wheels, gotta have those too. Okay, so the good field conditions though, that's another benefit of high speed planning. It's not only about going faster, maybe getting done sooner, but it also gives you the opportunity and confidence that you can wait, be more patient for the right field conditions, okay? Let your neighbor go out there and play in the mud. Let him go out a day before you and test those waters. You wait for the right conditions, put it all into good conditions, and probably still beat him done planting anyway. So it makes it, it, makes it for an opportunity where we can be more patient and we can put our crop into good conditions more often. So one of the questions that we get when we start talking about high-speed planning is no-till at 10 mile an hour. I just can't do that in my conditions, my fields. Uh, this is a video showing us doing it with the Exact Emerge planner. So this is 10 mile an hour, no-till field, uh, beautiful conditions, planners, everything's working optimum conditions the proper way. And so it can be done, but like I mentioned before, all those pieces of the puzzle have to come together perfectly to be able to do this. So yes, it can be done, uh, but you do have to have your completed puzzle all put together. So. That's it for planner attachments for today. Really appreciate you joining with us. If you have any questions at all, please reach out to your local BEX representative. We'd be more than happy to answer any and all questions you may have. Thanks and have a great day.